Before we um, commence, I would like to uh, acknowledge the Indigenous people, both past and present, and uh, pay my respects to any elders here and members of the community. Uh, this is the first of our uh, flagship series for 2015. And we have four major lectures and then other events around that. And it's, uh, we're going into our fifth year and we've covered quite a lot of topics now. And tonight is uh, a really excellent uh, subject, uh, particularly if, it, if you are watching the news over the weekend. Uh, but I'm not going to introduce the speaker yet. I'm just mentioning what we're talking about because my privilege is to, uh, is to um, introduce our Deputy Vice-Chancellor, Professor Francis Shannon. Uh, Francis has been a great supporter of CAF since its inception and continues to be, thank you. And, and thank you to the university, and so does the ACT government, if there's anyone here from the ACT government uh, continuing to be active supporters of CURF. Uh, just before I finish, uh, CURF is about Canberra urban and regional futures, and so quite a lot of focus will be uh, occurring this year in branching out to our Australian capital region. So I was down visiting the Yurubadala Shire Council on Friday, and just looking for partnerships with local councils and, and building up that network and continuing com conversations with the Commonwealth as well. I was up at Parliament today and, and uh, still there's a strong interest up there still in uh, cities policy in one way or another. It uh, might not be called that, but it's definitely interest in uh, urban communities and sustainability. So um, without uh, wasting any more time, I'd like to uh, welcome Francis to introduce our guest speaker, Mark Croswell. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. And I'd like to add my welcome to the first CURF seminar for 2015 here at the University of Canberra. And I'd also like to acknowledge the Ngunnawal people of the land, um, the traditional owners of the land on which we meet. My job today is to introduce our guest speaker, Mark Crossweller from Emergency Management Australia. But more about Mark in a moment. Uh, I would like to just tell you a little bit about CURF. A lot of you may know, but I thought it was worth just uh, talking a little bit about what CURF is. It was established um, in 2010, if I remember correctly, as a joint initiative with the Climate Change Institute at the Australian National University and Barbara and um, the, the then director of the Climate Change Institute, Will Steffen, were the two instigators of, of this activity. And it's based here at the University of Canberra. It is funded as, uh, substantially by the ACT government, for which we are uh, very grateful. Uh, the ACT government have contributed to CURF uh, during that time period. And the overall objective of CURF is to find new pathways and implementation strategies for sustainable futures for cities and their regions. Now, Canberra is an ideal experimental city. I always think it's a growing city. It is maybe a bit different, but it is an interesting place in which to do this type of work. Uh, CURF um, provides links nationally and internationally too, and it works around four major themes. Climate change and sustainability, health and well-being, settlements and infrastructure, and green growth. Now, they're all very topical, very interesting areas uh, which require a lot of um, attention in the context of the develop, development of cities and their regions. CURF has been actively and continues to be involved in a number of research programs and national networks. An example is the National Climate Change Adaptation Research Network, uh, which it's been involved in for a, no, for, for a number of iterations and um, continues to have a strong interaction with, the, with NCARF, as it's called. Um, the research in this area is related to climate change and climate adaptation and uh, is of direct relevance to emergency management. Disaster management and uh, changing outcomes have been central to CURF research, in particular managing bushfire risk, and CURF was associated with the then bushfire CRC and now has links with the new um, CRC that grew out of the bushfire CRC, which is a broader um, broader disaster CRC, and I can't remember the exact name of it, but natural disasters and bushfire CRC. Um, 
And this brings me back to our speaker and topic uh, for today. So Mark is the, general, uh, the, the Director General of Emergency Management Australia and is responsible for coordination of Australia's responses to crises, including natural disasters and terrorist and security related incidents, both domestically and internationally. That's a big job in the current environment. These include major fire events in New South Wales between 1994 and 2009, the Sydney hailstorm in 1999, the Canberra bushfires in 2003, I'm sure many of you remember that uh, very well, I do certainly, the Victorian bushfires in 2009, the Queensland floods in 2011 and a major chemical fire here in Canberra in 2012. Of course, as Barbara mentioned, just over the weekend there was um, uh, situations in Queensland that, uh, that probably needed significant input from Emergency Management Australia. The title of Mark's talk today is The Inevitability of Disaster and How to Change the Outcome. So I'm sure given the recent events especially, everybody will be interested in the how to change the outcome bit, definitely. Um, thank you very much, Mark, for coming to the University of Canberra and I'm sure we will be very interested in your talk. I'm afraid that I have to go. I'm very sorry for that. I apologize for walking out, but uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of the time here. Thank you. Um, good evening, everybody. Thanks very much for the, um, the opportunity to have a brief chat this evening. But look, Barbara asked me late last year if I was happy to come and talk to Kerf just about, um, I guess, natural disaster across Australia and what, what we've learned in the last uh, 10 or 12 years or what we might have learned. But probably more importantly, um, what, what we perhaps haven't been learning and what we need to change in order to try and change the outcome. Um, it was mentioned just before I started this issue of cyclones and the cyclones that happened over the weekend. Just to, just to give you a very brief insight into that, when I was briefing up last Monday uh, to government in relation to the, un the, the next seven days of natural disaster, all the advice and the data suggested that the tropical lows in the Coral Sea and to the north of Australia would not develop. In fact, they remain tropical lows and probably wouldn't cause much grief. And um, by Tuesday morning, I had to eat my words as they said that both tropical lows looked like they would form into cyclones. What we weren't aware of or cognizant of was uh, tropical cyclone Marsha that uh, went from a Category 1 to a Category 5 in 24 hours. And, and that is, in fact, unprecedented, as I understand it, in Australia's climat climatological history, uh, certainly according to the, uh, to the Bureau of Forecasters that I spoke to on, uh, on Thursday night. Um, and so it leads to this, um, this issue of um, how disaster prone Australia really is. Because the following picture kind of illustrates that a little bit. Um, and these are, so the photos that I've, I've put up here are uh, all natural disasters, except for the one on the bottom right hand corner, which is uh, Japan as I understand it, but the rest of them I've been to. So um, over the last 30 years, it's been quite a fascinating um, career uh, through the world of natural disaster and their effects. And, and, I guess um, tonight's talk is very much as much a personal reflection as it is the current thinking in emergency management amongst policy makers uh, and governments more broadly, uh, fire commissioners, emergency services commissioners and the like. But um, I've come to realise in the last 30 years that um, the principal role of emergency management is in fact to reduce suffering, um, is to reduce the suffering of people. Um, and these disasters cause immense suffering to people. And uh, it was when I, um, I guess, started to look at these disasters from 2003 onwards, that it became very clear that there was something we weren't getting. There was, uh, and my experiences in 2003 were, were, I guess, personally quite profound, but the, opera, the, the fire of 2003 left um, Australia with some incredibly valuable lessons. Uh, some, some are understood, uh, well understood, some are not very well understood at all, and I hope to touch on a couple of those um, this evening. Um, but nonetheless, um, we had 2003 in uh, Canberra, we had 2009 in Victoria, we had the 10-11 uh, floods in Queensland and Victoria, we had the Rolly Stone fires in Perth, we had the Tasmanian bushfires in uh, 2012, uh, we had the Blue Mountains bushfires in 2012 as well. And all of those events caused um, either significant uh, levels of death uh, or certainly levels of destruction. And so over that 12 year period, you could, you could map seven or eight significant disasters across Australia that caused us a lot of grief. So this notion that um, the catastrophic disasters are rare is in fact, I think, a bit of a, uh, a, bit of a false notion. So 
any particular point on the landscape, you might wish to talk about rarity, but if you talk about it from a national perspective, the frequency is about every four to five years on average, and it appears to be increasing. Um, so if you look at all those things, they're all pretty confront. They're all you know quite confronting, and um, and certainly uh, cyclones, for example. So on the the bottom uh, the bottom row, second one in, that's Cyclone Yazi, which was a Cat Five that came in uh, to the north northern uh, coast of Queensland in uh, 2011. Um, interestingly, the difference between Yazi and Marsha, which uh, crossed the coast on Friday, was not so much about intensity but scale. And, uh, and Marsha was a Cat 5, but nowhere near the, the scale of Cyclone Yazi, and that, that often gets missed in the narrative or, the, or, or in the media. But um, with Marsha, for example, what, um, the way that evolved so quickly and the thing that we don't understand, which is the thing I think we've really got to, to explore in greater detail, is that we had come into this season uh, with a forecast uh, El Nino uh, event, which is, has a propensity towards dryness in Australia. Um, so El Nino being um, towards dryness and then La Nina being towards uh, flooding rain. And we saw it had an El, uh, a La Nina in 10-11 in the Queensland floods. So if I could just explain briefly um, the scenario that when you have a, an El Nino, the, the oceans in the equatorial Pacific, um, mid-Pacific towards South America, warm quite considerably. And in order to do so, they draw the, water, the warm water away from the Australian coast and move it towards South America. And then it couples or it links with the atmosphere and creates a cycle, which is once it, once it forms, it's unbreakable. You can't break it until autumn. So it'll, it'll continue to pervade through the summer months in Australia. Um, everything but the coupling between the atmosphere and the ocean occurred this summer. And the oceans off South America and in the equatorial Pacific were very, very warm. Um, and as I said, we're probably you know, just one factor away from a full-scale El Nino. But what didn't happen was that the warm water didn't disappear from Australia. And you might say, well, what's, how why is that so significant? Well, with such a, such a large body of warm water in the equatorial Pacific and a large body of warm water off the coast of Australia, nobody can actually explain how that happened because that the water was meant to move off and move towards the, the, the centre of the Pacific Ocean. So this notion of warming and certainly warming of oceans, which is, which is you know, of great interest to many. I'm, I'm not skilled to argue on a scientific basis the, the factors behind climate change, but if you were to ask me, is the climate changing, I'd say, well, based on those phenomena, absolutely. Um, so that a warm body of water um, created ocean temperatures of around 27 degrees, and that's what formed a Cat 5 cyclone, because the oceans were so incredibly warm uh, that they had enough energy to produce a cyclone of Cat 5 intensity. Um, so it's quite, it's quite a profound event. It'll take us a long time to understand uh, the details as to how it happened. Um, and so we had some modelling, we had some forecasting, and of course nature produced something out of left field which, was, uh, which is not what we expected. I, I, think, I think overall we've dealt with it rather well in, in so far as no one has died from either the Cat 5 cyclone in Queensland or the Cat 4 in um, just uh, east of Darwin in Ar Arnhem Land. So, um, quite spectacular events. But if I take you to the next slide, I just want to, um, and, and I promise you this will be the last um, uh, slide you'll have to look at and analyse, but it sort of tells a bit of a story. And I just need to use the slide to take you through it. So when we looked at all of these events, and particularly uh, the industry was posed some very, um, uh, quite profound questions after uh, 2009 in Victoria, uh, leading into 2010-11 in the flood. Area, and that was that how do you define success in disaster? And it's a really interesting question. How do you put success measures around disaster? They seem to be so tragic and they seem to be so, um, I guess, so complex that can you even e entertain the proposition of, of going towards success measures in disaster? And so w when we looked at it, we said, well, well okay, if you're going to measure it, what's missing here? So clearly what was missing is that we were starting to hit what, what I call points of limitation. So in other words, we developed as, as emergency services, as fire services, even as government, I guess, a little bit of a false proposition or a false notion of our capability. So we, our reassurance to the public that things would be OK was not ringing true. It first arose in the Canberra fires in 2003, um, where, where the authorities reassured the public that you know, things would be OK based on what they understood, based on what they knew and based on what they'd forecast. Any of, those, any of us who were there in 2003 would soon come to realise that that's not actually what happened and, and, that, we, and that what happened far exceeded our, essentially our capability. So this diagram sort of tells that story. So if you have a look on the very left, it's simply a scale of consequence. And I, and I simply say you just go from low to high. So if you look at the scale, it's just low to high. If you go to the other side of the chart, it's um, 
effectiveness from significant down the bottom to low at the top. And they're inversely proportional, if you like, for, for a good reason. And then across the bottom are simply scales of intensity. Um, and it's a really simple way of explaining where we, where we hit our limits. So, um, so if you look at the first um, uh, set of bar, uh, the bar chart or the bars on the left-hand side, the low to moderate events in Australia are your typical average everyday bushfire, everyday storm, uh, rain event. It, do, it really doesn't matter. Um, but we're very, very good at dealing with those. Does that make sense? So in any given day, in any given week, you'll see them, they come in, we deal with them. The consequences are actually very small. So the, f the first bar, if you like, in, in, in is our, what we would de deem to be our capability that we've built over many, many years. So for low to moderate events, we, our capability far exceeds the potential consequence, far exceeds it. And you get a little bit of residual sometimes. So sometimes we might lose a house, so there might be someone who's injured or worse, but, but generally speaking, it's fine. You move to the height of very high range, and we're still, we still do pretty well. The consequence starts to increase a little bit. The potential certainly increases. But overall, as a society, we do well. Now, if I take you back 100 years, this was our point of limitation. If I go back 100 years in European history or since, since European settlement, um, once you get to height of very high, we were hitting limits then. And we were seeing significant losses beyond that point. Yet the, yet the frequency of events was quite, was quite uh, high. So, so the loss rates were much higher, the damage rates were much higher, and so, so on and so forth. If I now move to severe, this is where I guess now we're starting to hit our, our upper limits. So if I, if I look at um, the, uh, the Tasmanian fires in 2012, which was a severe fire, no loss of life, relatively low uh, loss of property, given it was a, a 30,000 plus hectare fire that burned out in a single day, uh, producing immense intensity of fire. If you've ever seen the, the photos of the Tasmanian fires, for example, it's not something you'd stand in front of, it's not something you'd ever wish for. But nonetheless, the, 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 lo the loss of life was zero and the property loss was relatively low. But this was the comment from fire chiefs and emergency services chiefs and government officials and everybody else that, one, we dodged a bullet because it, in fact, could have been worse, and two, we were absolutely stretched. Um, and I've heard that come up time and time again when we've entered the space of severe intensity. So whether it's flood or storm or cyclone or fire, um, when we hit this point of severe, um, we tend to hit a limit. We tend to be on the margins of success. Then we move into the more intense events and we move into, uh, I said, the Blue Mountains fires in, in the beginning of, uh, uh, sorry, in October 2013, where uh, 240 odd houses, I think, were lost in a space of about half an hour to an hour. A significant event, it's certainly an extreme bushfire event. Very little, if anything, could be done about that loss. No loss of life, but the property loss was substantial. Uh, so in the suburb of Winmalee, a reasonably small suburb given the scale and complexity of the Blue Mountains, but 240 houses lost in a very short period of time. The effectiveness of fire services in that space was very limited. They, they had some effect, but very little effect. And you I think you're starting to see what I'm, what I'm, where I'm getting to here. And then you move to the Queensland floods, the Victorian bushfires, the Canberra bushfires, and our capacity to limit damage, our capacity to affect consequences, very, very small. In fact, almost negligible. So, um, you know, a, a wildfire will, on those days of catastrophic fire where they go wherever they like, whilst ever there's enough fuel available, the, the, the winds prevail, the humidity is as low as, you know, 5% or whatever the case might be, and the temperature is above 40 degrees, that fire is in control. It goes wherever it wants. It's the same when Queensland flooded. There's, there's absolutely zippo we can do about the impact of, of the hazard space itself. So what we found is that we, we keep hitting a point of limitation, but we don't actually understand what that point of limitation is. So we've, we've certainly, um, through a lot of our community education campaigns and through uh, looking at our capabilities, we've tended to err on the side of the lesser events. We've tended to, I guess, look at our capability in the context of, mo of the most frequent events and we've reassured ourselves um, that we'll be okay in the more intense events. So when the big ones come along, we find out that that's actually not quite true, um, that we're left wanting. And this was this question about success. How do you measure success? What does success look like in the context of catastrophic disaster? Ironically, the measure of success in catastrophic disaster is the maintenance of public trust and confidence. Um, it's not actually about death rates. It's not about property loss rates. It's actually about how people feel about the operation and the government's commitment, um, uh, the language that was used, the narrative, the facts and figures, were they telling the truth, 
did they espouse their limits? How did we get through to the other, other, other side of the equation? So when we looked at 2003, there was a huge drop in confidence for uh, fire emergency services and all that comes with it because the expectation of the public wasn't met. Simply, simply we, we had promoted a level of capability that didn't exist, but we also didn't understand the hazard space very well. It, come, it came up again in 2009 in Victoria, it came up again in 2010-11 in Queensland. So it was really worth looking into and saying, well, what's missing here? Well, if the success measure is public trust and confidence, how do you maintain it and how do you keep it? Um, how do you secure it to start with? So if I just go to the next slide, because this is the, the basis of the next 15 or 20 minutes, it's how do we think differently about these, these disasters? Well, first and foremost, is this notion of accepting inevitability. And often when I talk about this, people, uh, certainly when I started talking about this, people got quite incensed by the proposition of inevitability. But if you look at it, and if you look at any hazard space in a community, if you look at Canberra, for example, and if you go back far enough, you will see it littered with catastrophic fire activity in the Canberra region. 1939 is a, is a great example of a significant fire that uh, emanated out of the Brindabella Range. Uh, not quite so catastrophic, but still significant in 1954 and again in 2003. And if I go anywhere in the country and I have a look at their hazard profile, if I take a long enough view, I'll find it littered with catastrophe, lit littered with significant events. The irony is that we kind of forget about them after a while. We, we tend to trade them off. So, so this notion of inevitability is an interesting proposition. We, we use risk management in order to try and manage dollars, time, resources and effort. It's a very sensible thing to do from a management perspective. But what it's creating is a bit of a gamble. We're trading off here because we talk about likelihood and consequence. Um, and we look at likelihoods as being very rare. Consequence is very high, but likelihood is very rare. And we say, well, the likelihood is so rare, we won't worry too much about it. And that's the first paradox, that, that in a risk management context, the least likely implies you don't have to think too much about it. The most consequential implies the exact opposite. Where we've, where we've been stopping is on the least likely. We stop there. And, and so, for example, in the National Guidelines for Risk Management in Emergency Management, when you look at a hazard space, any hazard space that has a frequency of more than 100 years, the hazard, go and even though it might be a catastrophic consequence, the, the risk goes from extreme to high. It actually backs off because it's ba simply based on rarity. Now, that's sensible from a risk management point of view, but the consequence doesn't change and the management of that consequence is no better when it happens. So just rarity has no effect on consequence whatsoever. So, so it was the first thing that we, when we looked at it, we realised that we were leading ourselves down false paths. We were looking at rarity and trading off and saying, look, it's so rare, we don't need to invest too much into this. Now, from an economic and social point of view, it's a fair, it's a fair argument. The, the dollars, time, effort and resources of society need to be spread in a whole range of different ways would you attempt to mitigate a catastrophic consequence disaster that had a return period of one in 500 years? And, and the answer is no, you wouldn't. But what, you, what we ought to do is invest our thinking into it. So there is a point where you say, we'll invest dollar time, effort and resources to a point to mitigate to a level. And, and with, with the processes, we kind of work that through with communities and we, and we do trade it off and we, work, and we say, okay, we'll mitigate to this level and then, and then we tend to walk away. We don't look at the residual risk. Um, and that, that's what's catching us out. So in Canberra, for example, there was evidence given in the, Royal, in the uh, coronial inquiry uh, by two quite distinguished gentlemen who had forecast in quite general terms that very day back in 1998. Um, now, they weren't fortune tellers. They were, it was simply a reasonable proposition. It was quite a reasonable proposition. And it, was, and it came out in evidence in the inquiry, it was acted upon to a point by the community, but not to the full extent that it could have been. It has been now, I've got to tell you. I think the learning, you know, bitter experience was the lesson. But, but nonetheless, these things are in fact forecastable. You can see them coming if, you, if we choose to look carefully. So, so as I said, rarity might reduce the risk, and, but it doesn't reduce the consequence. Um, and we're seeing the consequences manifest. So 10-11 in Queensland, a significant consequence manifested. Uh, Canberra in 2003, the same. Victoria in 2009, the same. W when I went to Marysville in 2009, uh, a couple of days after the fire went through, and it was probably, well, certainly the most damage I'd seen in one community. I'd, I've seen a lot in my life, but uh, quite spread across. But uh, to, you know, to see, the, to see the deaths of over 30 people in one town and, and all but about a dozen buildings uh, d uh, d completely destroyed um, was, was quite overwhelming. But, 
What was even more overwhelming was this, this um, uh, I guess, realisation of the inevitability of Marysville's vulnerability. That it was, a, it was a village that sat on the top of a ridge in the sea of a forest that had been drought stressed for 10 years, that had come under catastrophic fire weather condition and, and sure enough all the elements came together and the fire moved through. Now, you could say that's easy with the benefit of hindsight. I would say for those who are experienced in the industry, it was actually not really very surprising at all. Um, but had we turned our minds sufficiently to the problem before the day and the answer was no, we hadn't. So as an industry, we do have the capacity to see it, but we tend to move past it pretty quick because we trade it off. So there's an absolute imperative of, of those you know, professionals in this space to have a much better look than they're having at the moment. Um, the interesting thing with Canberra was that when I spoke to one of the commanders in, in that operation on the day in 2003, we had quite a difference of opinion about how, how to deal with that strategically and operationally. And it played out the way it played out. But some seven years later, when I became commissioner in Canberra, um, the Chief Minister pulled me aside, John Stanhope, and, he, and he, I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but he, he, he explained how um, that commander had experienced that fire and he, and he said, look, John, that fire went beyond my knowledge, anything I'd ever learnt in my life. It went beyond my skills, anything I'd ever acquired. It went beyond my experience, anything I'd ever been through. He said, but what really caught me out is it went beyond my imagination. And he just couldn't imagine the fire doing what it did. And it, it, it is, in fact, a profound statement in emergency management because that happens to you and I every day. But the consequences are either so small that you don't notice or you don't care, one or the other. But occasionally something comes along and the consequence is enormous. And the industry suffered from this, this problem of lack of knowledge, skills, experience and imagination. No one could have imagined what that fire would have done or did do. Now that's a, that's a reasonable statement. It's certainly a defence in terms of getting blame off the, off the agenda. It's not a defence in terms of accountability. Uh, so let me be clear about that. The people are still accountable for their actions and lack thereof. I'm not saying that this is a faultless space, but, but we certainly moved very quickly into the space of blame. Um, ironically, we moved into the space of blame on the basis that that thing probably wouldn't happen again. Uh, and there were six years of legal debate and community debate ab about whether it should or shouldn't have and all that comes with it. And then it, up, and then it pops up again in Victoria in 2009. Um, so what was not learned in 2003, particularly around public messaging and warnings and communication, was to play out in 2009 with a much more tragic consequence. So rather than four dead, it was 173 dead. And whilst that's only part of the problem, it was quite a significant reflection of the industry that was unable to move past the last disaster, uh, some, somehow pretending that the next one wasn't to, was going to be a long way away. Well, it was six short years and it popped up in a different state and we had to deal with it in a much more profound way. So this notion of inevitability and changing the way we think about risk is fundamental to how you shift um, people in this space. So what does that look like in practical terms? So first of all, we, we're trying to help people get past residual risk and move into that space in terms of potential consequence. So we say, look, accept the inevitability of disaster in your community, because if you've had it in the past, you'll have it in the future, unless there's been a significant shift of land use or a significant shift uh, in some way, shape or form that negates the potential for that hazard to impact. But, um, so if you've had it in the past, if you've witnessed it in this lifetime, if science says it'll happen in the future, then you can bet your bottom dollar that it will. Um, so what do practical measures look like? Well, it's really reasonably simple to, to take you through it, quite complex in terms of its methodology, but the first thing to do with any given hazard space is to look at its full potentiality. So you can apply the principles of risk management if you wish, but look at its full potentiality and then model it and run it. And, and, and with today's technology in the space of flood, fire, storm and cyclone, and even earthquake, you can absolutely model. You can model the effect on society. You can model the effect on the land use. To try and paint a picture as to what might happen, and I'll give you some practical examples in a minute, but. Um, so the first thing is to actually run the model against the land use, against the hazard space at its most critical end and see what happens. Just paint the picture. It's a fascinating picture. The next thing to do is narrate the story and actually just talk about what's happening as you run it, explain it, what's actually unfolding. It's incredibly complex, incredibly complex. Once you've got through the narrative, the picture and the narrative, you start to work out the immeasurable complexity of the problem. And it's extremely overwhelming, I've got to tell you. It's incredibly overwhelming. And then the fourth thing is to try and solve it. How do you solve it? 
Now you might say, well, what a futile exercise. But that's what happened in Canberra, and that's what happened in Victoria, and that's what happened in Brisbane, because we hadn't thought about it enough. So what then happens is you have to deal with all of those things as it's unfolding, not beforehand. So if you think it's complex before, try solving it during. So when I went to the US last year, I went to, uh, earlier last year I went to Seattle, and later in the year I went to Anchorage in Alaska. So I'll deal with Anchorage first. They had a 9.2 earthquake in 1964 that rattled for five minutes and it destroyed the city of Anchorage. If you go to Anchorage now, it's five times the size. It has an enormous gas pipeline running, a, running through it and, and off into the mainland US from, uh, from the Arctic. The infrastructure that's, got, that's running across Alaska now is infinitely more complex than it was 50 years ago. And they've rerun it uh, to try and solve it now because they know, they accept the inevitability of the next 9.2. So they don't know when, and that's the irony with natural disaster, you don't get to choose them. They come our way, we, you know, this thing about one in 100, one in 500, one in 1,000 is actually an intensity measure. There's no guarantee they'll happen in that period. You could have two or three in that same period. But they have accepted the inevitability of a plus nine magnitude earthquake in Anchorage, and they're working through trying to solve it. And when they paint the picture, it's immeasurably complex. And when they tell the story, it takes a long time. And when they find the problems, they run into pages. And when they try and solve it, um, they hit brick walls in their mind. But they know they're better off doing it now than when it happens. So when I went to Seattle, same problem. Seattle's even more complex. It is a city five times the size of Anchorage. And most of the city is built on, on um, uh, not landfill, but um, uh, fill from glacial movement, so it's very, very uh, um, volatile. So most of their in, uh, in industrial area, most of the city, all the lowland in Seattle, if you've ever been there, is all on land that didn't exist five, six hundred years ago. It only existed as a result of the last earthquake. And, and the, uh, the Native Americans understood that. The Europeans didn't, and when the Europeans started building on it, the Native Americans just shook their head and said, I wouldn't do that. And of course, the Europeans didn't listen. So you know, that's the story they tell. I'm sure. I'm sure it's true. But nonetheless, they've they've modelled that, and 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 at, uh, just uh, again plus nine because they've had a plus nine, nine point six. I think they've had in Seattle, in their history. The death rates are extraordinary. They're over twenty. They forecast over twenty thousand will die. They forecast injury rates in the hundreds of thousands, and all access into the city will disappear. So all the freeways and the viaducts and everything else will collapse. It's extraordinary. And, and again, they'll be called upon one day to solve that in real time. So they're trying to solve it now. So there's some really good examples across the world um, where they're actually running these things on the basis of inevitability to try and develop skills about how to solve complex problems and how to try and envisage what something might look like to close off this gap of lack of imagination. So using their minds, using their imagination, taking the time to do it, how do they get better at these things? Because the whole point of catastrophe is you can't solve them. They're too, they're too complex, but you can get better at them if, if you choose. But in, in Australian society particularly, we tend not to do that. It was interesting, when I was talking to the South uh, Australian Chief Officer, um, part of my role is to travel with the Prime Minister and provide advice in major disaster. We went to Adelaide a few weeks ago. And the chief officer pulled us aside and said, you know, because we've been talking about this proposition for a couple of years, so they ran a cabinet exercise with the government and the heads of emergency services on a, on a worst case Adelaide Hills bushfire scenario. Um, and they had run that scenario three weeks before that fire in Adel the Adelaide Hills. Uh, Greg said to me, he said, Mark, you, you, you won't believe how similar this fire played out to the exercise. It was ex he said it was extraordinary. And they had actually exercised their cabinet the head of, heads of government and the emergency services through the process of a, of a catastrophic fire in the Adelaide Hills. And he said you, you could have almost mapped it then and just put it on the table and it was almost the same event. So it was just a really simple example as to how, when we apply our minds, that it actually works. Um, but you can take it even a step further. And um, if you look at what's happened in Marysville, for example, I'll go back to Marysville, um, they've almost over-recovered. And if you, uh, there was a recent article on the ABC, I think, and they went back to Marysville and had a look at uh, what's happened down there. And, and people have been so generous that they've built all sorts of things which the community thinks is wonderful, but the councils looked at it and said, how are we going to afford this? Uh, they've got all sorts of infrastructure and buildings and extra facilities, but only half the population, only about half the population returned 
to Marysville. So they now have a 30-year legacy about how do you fund infrastructure for which there's not enough population to sustain. And somebody actually said quite profoundly, we should have thought about this before the fire. And it's, I think it's very true. And, and in the next um, coming weeks and months, the government will probably make more, uh, espouse more commentary about this, this approach. And I'm not, not here to give away government policy or its thinking, but, but we've thought long and hard about this. And we've, we have said, based on this process, that you actually can start to design for recovery before an event. Um, and that is quite a profound shift. Uh, particularly in terms of how the land is used, uh, particularly in terms of where infrastructure is located, uh, its age, its construction, uh, its construction type and so on and so forth, that you can actually foresee or foreshadow significant impact and vulnerability and start to make planning decisions about how you will deal with that. Um, now that's a big shift and, and where in some communities you can't even get them to do a risk assessment um, because the, you know, the, the um, the powers to be a bit worried about the result. So they tend not to go even anywhere near a risk assessment. So trying to get them from a risk assessment to, to designing a recovery outcome before an event is going to be no mean feat. But there are other communities who are quite prepared to, to, uh, to step into that space. So in the US, um, particularly in Tornado Alley, there's a number of cities that uh, took up this proposition and redesigned their cities or part of their cities once the tornado went through. So they lost a good part of the town and when they went back, they didn't put it back the way it was. They put it back the way they wanted. And, and they had for a number of years thought about a city that looked different, that felt different, that attracted a different uh, demographic, whatever the case might be. They took the outcomes of a tornado and implemented that in a planning, design and construction sense. So it might sound really rational, and, and to a large degree it is. Um, but it's based on the premise of the proposition of inevitability and if a hazard, if a hazard exists within your community profile and, it, and if history shows it's hit catastrophic proportions in the past and science says it'll hit catastrophic proportion in the future, then there's a fair and reasonable proposition it's going to happen and if it is, we'd be better off turning our minds to it before it happens. None of this requires a lot of money, I've, I've got to say, but it does require effort. So when, when I was Commissioner here in Canberra, we just to prove the point, we modelled the catastrophic failure of the Gugong Dam. And uh, the head of service at the time, Andrew Cappy Wood, said to me, I think you were there, Jeremy, actually, he said, it was in a, a SEMSOG meeting, I hope you're not going to come to me for more money, because he thought we were going to try and mitigate it. And we said, no, no, we just want to understand what the effect is. So, so we engaged a hydrologist, I think it cost us 20,000 bucks or something, $25,000, and we modelled the catastrophic failure of Gugong to, to work out what it might look like. So we. We attained elevations of Lake Burley Griffin and obviously a plan of, uh, of Canberra and we modelled it and it was astounding at how little damage that catastrophic failure would cause. Now it would take out Commonwealth and Kings Avenue bridges, cause a lot of inundation to the public buildings along the lakefront uh, and there were some other effects. It's not, it's not like it's a zero effect. But it was interesting that it wasn't as bad as people had envisaged out of ignorance and when we ran it, it was actually better than we thought and it was bad enough. Now, what did we do with that? We just filed it, so filed it away. We wrote it up, we captured it, we documented it, and we moved on. So it cost us 20 grand to work out what a catastrophic failure of a dam might look like. Um, but the experience of going through that process was invaluable because it dispelled a lot of, a lot of myth about what would happen if Gugong failed. Now, I don't know how it would fail. It's kind of not the point. It was just trying to prove the concept. Um, so this, this is in fact happening um, in many places across the world where people have come to accept the inevitability. So if I look at uh, impacted communities in Queensland, and um, there's a bit of a sensitivity here because it's such a recent event, but there are some communities that are um, a bit upset about feeling like they've been forgotten. And I think that's very real, and it's, I think that's very true. That's how people feel. It is absolutely how they feel. I, I've been there. I remember when I went to Tully, after Cyclone Yazi walking the streets of Tully and um, people were mortified, not because of the cyclone, but because the army had pulled out with no notice. So when the government sent the army into a system, they felt like somebody cared. And then when the army was redeployed for another tasking based on a higher priority, they just packed up and went and the community felt absolutely devastated. They just felt abandoned. Um, it was a really interesting response. But, but what, how, how different might it look if communities were better prepared based on accepting that at some point in time these events will happen and when they do, what will they do about them? And this notion of trading off likelihood and consequence leaves people in a bit of grey space and they don't think too much about it. The event happens and they're caught out, they're sort of caught wanting. 
So that's the premise for tonight. I, I won't talk about the ethical premise, the premise of leadership. It's more a, um, I probably don't have time anyway. We've got a few minutes. Um, look, I'll just, I'll just touch on this, and this is more a discussion for people who have to lead through this as opposed to the entire community. If I try to get this in the entire community, I think it would take me about five eons of lifetimes to, to engender. But, but what, the, um, what commissioners and chief officers, uh, uh, senior police and others learnt was that, there is, was that there was an ethical premise to disaster. There is absolutely an ethical premise to disaster. And, and I'll encapsulate it by simply saying this, that, that natural disasters are more a matter of the heart than the head. And unless a leader understands that, you can put up all the statistics and all the facts and figures that you like, but you'll, you will not engage the community and lead them through what is clearly a disastrous event that affects them emotionally very deeply. Um, we didn't understand that in 2003. We didn't understand it in 2009. We started to get a sense of it in 2011. And then if you case study the leadership of, say, Shane Fitzsimmons in the Blue Mountains fires in, in October 2013 and Mike Brown in Tasmania, you'll start to realise that they've tapped into the fact that the disaster is more a matter of the heart than the head. And then when they show a vulnerability, they make a connection. And when they make a connection, people tend to trust them more. And I'm sort of oversimplifying, but, but there is an ethical premise to this. This notion of trust and confidence can never be understated and has to be the highest success measure. And how you achieve that is open to a whole lot of interpretation and innovation and creativity, but we can't lose it. It's, it's simply too valuable to lose. The principle of unity is that how do you bring communities together to solve immeasurably complex problems? If, if we don't establish a collective wisdom about the problem, we won't establish a, a collective wisdom about an outcome. And many communities are very divided on their, on their, well, they're divided generally speaking, but they're certainly divided on how to deal with the hazard space. And they take that division into operations, they take it into the event. And I've often said in my 30 years, if you haven't unified before an event, you better hurry up and unify during it, because you certainly won't be unified after it, when the fingers come out and all the blame starts to be apportioned. And those who unify before tend to get through and survive and recover much quicker than those who have not unified on the issue. Again, it's a philosophical premise. The issue of humility is, a, is, a, is an issue that the industry has had to learn in, in uh, huge amounts. We, we had to accept that we couldn't save everybody, that we didn't know it all, that we couldn't guarantee safety. On some days, we couldn't even guarantee the effectiveness of our resources. On the worst day of the worst bushfire, fire trucks, helicopters and all that comes with it make little, if any, impact whatsoever. Uh, it's the same in the Queensland floods in 1011. A helicopters, uh, swift water rescue made some impact. I'm not saying it's no impact, but it's neg negligible compared to the size and scale of the event. Um, for us to admit that as an industry, and I say us because I've been in it 30 years, albeit I'm now at the national level, um, has taken a huge pill of humidity by, humility by the industry to actually realise that we have a limitation. The notion of compassion, I've got to say, again, looking at more matters of the heart than the head, there's not a person who's not impacted by disaster, either those managing or those experiencing or those reporting upon. Um, and we would do, do well to remember that because I'm yet in my 30 years to meet anybody who wasn't primarily motivated to do the best they could to help somebody else. But how often do we take that into our thought process when we're dealing with these things? Almost never. And the last one is forgiveness. And I, you know, I, I often talk a lot about this in the leadership simply because a lack of it prevents learning. Uh, if I use that simple example from 2003 to 2009 and this propensity to blame after 2003, there were six valuable years we could have learned something about public communication and warnings that we didn't. And it played out in, in a much more devastating way in 2009. And it's just a simple snapshot and observation of the dynamics at the time. We we're too distracted by the last event and we weren't looking for the next one. And it, when it popped up, boy, did it pop up. Now, none, these, these, uh, these uh, I guess, ethical premises are not trying to paint pictures of perfection, but what we do in leadership is try and encourage leaders to um, lead through them, to, to look at these lenses or use these lenses in which to lead. Um, and and we've, we're starting to realise that we're getting a much better result. We're getting people through disaster better by actually being more real, more human, if you like, or, or better connected. I, and I can't stress enough... You know, for years we've dealt with the statistics, the facts, the figures, the death rates, the loss rates. It's all very important, but it's all head stuff at the end of the day. And, and leadership has to connect with people. If it connects with people, it's got a better chance of leading, leading people through the disaster. So that's my proposition. Um, 
this thinking and, and a little bit more is pervading in the policy space at, at, uh, at the federal government level, at the state, state and territory governments in emergency services and other pockets of emergency management. But it's really, it's really seed stuff. It's, it's, it's just starting to sort of take effect. And it's many years of observation and reflection by uh, many experienced practitioners and academics who are starting to look at this and say there's got to be another way. But, but critically, this, this limitation in the thinking about risk, the trading off rarity for consequence, uh, is, is wrong. We've got, to, we've, got to, we've got to fix that. So, as I said right at the start, it's OK to risk manage in order to apportion dollars, time, effort and resources to the best effect and use rarity as a way of actually ameliorating the cost, that's fine. But, but in so doing, um, we have to appreciate the residual risk and how we will deal with it when it manifests. And if we don't do that, we've only got half the picture or we've only looked at half the problem. We have to go and look at the whole problem. And yes, it takes time. Yes, it's really hard work because once you go beyond knowledge, skills, experience and imagination, and that's what the scenarios do, if you go through that, paint the picture, tell the story, um, find the problem, propose the solution, the first thing you hit is your own ignorance about the complexity. It's extraordinary. It is absolutely mind-numbing. But everyone else goes through the same experience. And it's only over time that you unpackage it and learn to get better at complex problem solving and analysis that you realise that there are other ways of dealing with this problem. And all of that is building skills for the next event that you can't see coming but you're going to have to apply anyway. So if it does nothing else but educate the community on how to deal with these things better, it's a win. But it actually does more than that. It actually changes decisions. It changes the way resources are used. It changes the way policies are developed. So the thinking about designing recovery before an event arises from this thinking, about saying if you take the problem through to its natural conclusion, you can actually work it back and start to preposition for impact and start to make decisions ahead of time about what you'll do when, when it happens. And certainly the people in Marysville, I think some of them, if they had their time over, would have preferred to have redesigned their village before the fire in a more sensible way than where they ended up after the fire. And I've, I've, I've heard the argument from recovery people for many, many years that, that those impacted should lead recovery. And I, I absolutely agree with that. And certainly that's been my experience, you get the best result, but only when they have the mental capacity to do so and the emotional capacity to do so. And for many, immediately after the event, they don't have it. Um, and they either make unwise choices or no, no choices about their recovery. If you can take them into the space safely before the event, you probably get a more sensible outcome or a more sensible picture so that when the event happens, at least there's a basis in which to speak of for recovery that people have agreed to or most people have agreed to. It's not, it doesn't have to be the final picture, but it's probably going to be a better picture than if you tried to do it um, immediately after the event. So in terms of Canberra, um, to bring it to the local, um, Canberra has learnt an enormous amount about 2003. I, I, I've always said this publicly that the strategic bushfire management plan and the framework that attaches is probably the best in the country. There's no doubt about that. The planning controls put into the western side of Canberra uh, in relation to asset protection zones and fuel zones and the like, again, are probably the most, uh, the most um, comprehensive in Australia. It's no, no doubt. When I came here from New South Wales and looked at them, I was very impressed by the the distances and the methodology behind how those zones were applied. Um, the city itself is designed well for flood, of course, um, apart from flash flooding, which is a bit hard to forecast. But it's quite a resilient city. I'm not sure the people are as resilient as they could be, but that's not a problem that's uh, unique to Canberra. I think that's a problem right across Australia. Um, but clearly, a lot was learnt um, from that experience. I think there's a lot more to learn, and we'll only really know when you get the next one coming out of the Brindabella range, which in itself is inevitable. It's happened before and it'll happen again. That'll be the true test. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Stay here, Mark. Okay, stay here. <laughs> thank you, Mark. Uh, now we've got time for questions. So. Uh
so, so I th look, it's a really good question. I think the key to it is that people worry that if you look too hard, you'll spend more money. That that you'll you want to tr you'll keep trying to mitigate uh, the problem and try and engineer it out of society, and and it's not possible anyway. So there is a point of reasonableness where you say the investment of dollars, time, effort, and resource is reasonable to this point, and you can leave the rest of it based on rarity, providing you understand how you'll deal with it when it happens. And I think that's all it is. It's a thought process. It's not about investing more money. But the, the problem is people move it to blame and they move it to leverage and they move it for political purposes and that's why it's always been shut down. So there was a report uh, written about 2006 I think or 2007 that modelled some uh, scientifically based catastrophic disasters across Australia and the report was produced and then it was subsequently shut down because it was too confronting. But it was based on good science and it was based on good modelling but it was just too confronting and so it, it got closed off. It was eventually released under FOI a few years later, but uh, this is not a pretty space to enter, I've got to tell you, and as Director General of the EMA, I've been you know, more than a bit nervous from time to time putting my big toe in this space, but I've just seen the consequence of not doing it uh, and I've seen the rest of the world uh, have the courage to step into it. And I often say to people, we don't have to have a silly conversation, you just have to have a sensible conversation about limitation if you, if you apply risk treatment, in, or in, in applying risk treatments, it's very important to understand the limit of its effectiveness. So I'll give you a simple example that in, in the building code, um, we, can, we can protect buildings up to a fo forest fire danger indices of 100. And then anything above 100, you cannot guarantee the safety of a building. So building codes have a limitation, and it's an FFDI of 100, essentially. So beyond that, you say we cannot guarantee protection. It's, I'm glad we know that for example. Um, there are other limits. It's a simple thing. You build a flood levy at eight metres, it fails at 8.2. Does that make sense? So, so you can mitigate up to eight metres and you say anything up to eight metres is fine. This is what happened in uh, Hurricane Katrina in, in uh, the southern part of the US. They had thought they'd mitigated for the worst possible flooding circumstance. They'd actually engineered into the landscape other problems they couldn't see until those levies were breached. And when they were breached, all those inherent problems that they'd actually inadvertently designed into the landscape popped up, but they didn't know until they, until they experienced it. They looked back and realised that there'd been a failure in imagination and leadership around Katrina because it was always, th those levees were built in the 50s and 60s and the hazard space had intensified and they hadn't modelled sufficiently the effect of that increasing hazard space. So it, it is a bit fraught because people will cut you off at the knees or they'll cut you off at the conversation if you move into one in 500, you know, one in 1,000, one in 200, even one in 100, because it seems to be so rare as to not to be worth considering. So, so certainly, it's not, there's no point in trying to mitigate it unless it's, unless it's effective to do so, cost effective to do so, or society agrees. But it is absolutely imperative to think about it and work out how do you deal with the bit that's left over. That residual risk is where things happen. So that original chart I showed you, which is, which is a bit complex to put up in a public talk, so I apologise, just talks about consequence, and it talks about potential consequence which is mitigated through risk treatment, and then actual consequence which is where the risk treatment fails. So if you did nothing in a bushfire, let's so say 20 houses come under a threat in a bushfire, you've done no hazard reduction, no community education, and didn't respond to fire truck, you'd probably lose 20 houses out of 20 houses. But if you put in hazard reduction, educate the community and send a fire truck, you might lose one. So in other words, risk treatment has an effectiveness. It actually reduces potential consequence. The actual consequence is one house. The actual consequence could have been 20 houses if you did nothing about it. So, but, but then you sort of take a, a, a worst case scenario in that bushfire and you realise you can't get the fire truck in. The hazard reduction has been inadequate or it's three years old, so it's lost its effectiveness. Um, and the people didn't really study their, didn't write their bushfire plan properly, then all of a sudden you're back up to losing 16 houses because the, the intensity of the hazard has exceeded the risk treatment effectiveness. So, um, so when we do risk treatment, we've got to understand what's the limitation. Where, what, are we, what are we treating up to? What point are we treating to? And what does that world look like beyond it? This is classic Queensland. It's, it's classic Blue Mountains. It's classic... Hurricane Katrina. They all, all those risk treatments were exceeded. Um.
skillfully is the best way to describe it. Uh, uh, and uh, as I said, when we first tried this with the, the Gugong Dam collapse, the, he the head of service, Andrew Cappy Wood, who, who I got on extremely well with and had a, a lot of time for, just pulled me up straight away and said, you're not going to get any more money for this because he, he thought we were going to move to mitigate. And we had to explain to him what our thinking was. And so I think that, so what, when we, and we're still crafting narrative about this, how do, how do we go out more broadly across Australia and say, look, let's have a sensible conversation about what this could look like in time with, and not have a silly conversation about it. And it sounds, patr I don't mean to sound patronising, but we're working out the pathway in and the narrative into this space. And, and largely history and science are the, are, the greatest, are the greatest doorways or avenues. His, history is quite compelling if you look hard enough and far enough. History is compelling. Science is compelling, really. You can, you can deal with it on the facts. Inevitability is a premise, but it's all, it, which is the basis of an argument, but I also think it's a truth. I, I think it's a philosophical proposition that any, any community that has had catastrophic bushfire in the past and recently will have it in the future. And, and what's wrong with looking at it now? See, the, if I, the very opening statement of my talk was that the whole purpose of emergency management was to reduce suffering. And it is. And if you're going to do that, one of the greatest ways of reducing suffering is to spell ignorance, is to get rid of ignorance. So I look at many communities, and I've had the benefit of experience and knowledge and all sorts of things in disaster space. And I look at how they suffer and I say, if only someone had to talk to them about X, if only someone had to help them understand a little bit better about the potentiality of that hazard or what it might look like, maybe they wouldn't be suffering so much now. So this notion of ignorance, and there are some corners of society where if you try and get them to express data for, for analysis, they won't give it to you because they're too worried about the consequence of, of expressing it, not the consequence of the event. But if they give the data up, they might be held to account or they might be found liable for a poor decision in the past. And I say to them, well, if you think that's bad, wait till it happens and then present yourself in front of the court and explain that you held that data 15 years ago and you didn't release it. And this, is, this, this, this debate started with, for me 20 years ago when I was a superintendent in New South Wales and it's still going on now 20 years later. I, I'm still hearing this argument put up time and time again. We can't release that data because we're afraid that we might be held to account or sued for a poor decision from the past. But the problem is that decision, whether you, irrespective of how you judge it, has in, inherently embedded something into the landscape which is now vulnerable. And wouldn't you want to know about the vulnerability before it happened so you, could, you had the right to make a choice about what you did about it? This is nothing more at the end of the day than expressing truth, trying to understand the landscape better and its vulnerabilities and then making decisions about what we'll do before the thing happens. Because here's the rub, you don't get to choose the event anyway. It's that profound. You do not get to choose a bushfire, a flood, a storm, a cyclone or an earthquake. There is no choice in the matter whatsoever. And you can statistically rationalise it all you like about frequencies, one in 100, one in 500, one in 1,000. That's fine to measure intensity, but I don't know any more than you do whether the camera's going to shake tomorrow to 6.8. And it can. And if it did, what would it look like? And, and so that's the, th that's the thought process. But unfortunately, people get very nervous about it because they don't want it to happen. And that, ironically, is a bit of a pervading arrogance in society that we actually think we get to choose. <laughs> On some level, there's a, there's a sort of a mode of thinking that says, well, no, we get to choose this. We did a risk assessment and we looked at likelihood and consequence. And it's very rare, it's one in 500 years, so we choo we'll choose not to deal too much about that. We'll deal with a one in 50 year event. If you, if you unpackage that, you say, but, but do we have the power to, to do that? Do we actually, is that fully for us to choose? And the answer is no, it's not. So, so you can look at it and say, it probably won't happen. It's very unlikely, but you can't say it won't. So if you can't say it won't, surely then it must be inevitable. And if it's inevitable, it's not a bad premise in which to start from to try and understand how you might solve it should it occur. You'll mitigate to here, and then you'll have to deal with the rest of it when it happens. As long as you understand what the rest of it looks like when it happens, because it's immeasurably complex, as long as you have some sense of that, you'll do better. If you have no sense of it, you'll, the, the, consequence, the, the outcome is just too, too, too hard to think about. And that's the whole premise of the, of the process.
that's a po that's a policy question. I, I can only give a personal view to a policy question. I, I can't, I, look, I, and look, I'm here tonight in my personal capacity, not not as the as I said as the government representative. So, um, look, it's a really good question, and there's no easy answer to that. Um, um, and the, um, we all sort of understand the current government policy. You know, the former gov government policies around climate change. I think it's fair to say though that the current government accepts the climate is changing. I just, I'm just not sure it's fully, it fully accepts the reasons why that are put forward by, by the climate change advocates at the moment. It's the best way I can describe that environment without putting, dropping myself right in it. But, but suffice to say that I, th I think um, this notion of changing climate is quite unambiguous. And, and when I ask people to look at scenarios, I say look at history because it's, it's a great teacher. But look at science, because science will tell you trends. It'll tell you what's what, what's likely to happen in the future, and that's that's around intensity of hazard. It's around all sorts of things. I think the science science element is as important as the history element. You put the two together. It's what they've done in Seattle. It's what they've done in California. It's what they've done in Anchorage. They've essentially brought history and science together, and land use, history, science, and land use. What is it? What is it? What picture does it tell? And then and then how do you narrate it? How do you uh, identify the problems, how do you find the solutions. So, um, so modelling is important and most of this stuff will have to be done through modelling anyway. So if you're going to model a bushfire, a flood, an earthquake or a cyclone, um, there's software, there's, there's absolute capability in, in society now to do that. And then you can, you can change the inputs to have a look at worst case plus 10%, worst case plus 20% or whatever the case might be. But from a policy point of view, very, very difficult. We, we simply used the evidence of the last five years around the ocean, the ocean's warming, the, the, the warming of the continent the last three summers and the effect that that produced on bushfire activity. Um, the, you know, the manifestation of a Cat 1 to Cat 5 cyclone in 24 hours as a result of, you know, very warm oceans off Australia. You can use all of that as evidence and say, well, you know, things have shifted, at least in, in recorded history, and what might that mean? Um, the, the whole point of this is not to get the perfect picture or the specifics of the impact. It's to get more skilled at dealing with them when they happen. So how do you get people to think more contingently, to think, uh, think more completely, and to use those experiences through scenarios and other things to develop skills so that when the real thing happens, which will actually ironically be different but similar. So that example I gave in South Australia where they modelled the Adelaide Hills fire, and then, and as Greg said, you could have put it on the table the, the, the exercise fire and it was almost the same damn fire that they had to fight. So, so sometimes the parallels are quite extraordinary but, but it's about upskilling and trying to move past this space of resistance. You know, I don't want it to happen therefore it won't. That's what causes people the greatest grief is that they develop an ignorance about the problem. They develop an ignorance about the, the full potential of the hazard space that they live in. And, and that, that is one of the greatest root causes of suffering of people that they just didn't know and they didn't take the time to understand it better. And if they had of, they still would have suffered, they still would have lost something, but I can guarantee you it wouldn't have been as long or profound as it was because they didn't know anything about it at all. And particularly when you realise that they could have found out something about it before it did happen. Okay. One last, just yeah, on, uh, Jeremy, yeah, Jeremy, but just on climate change, it's been interesting, both uh, the Academy of Australian Academy of Science and NASA have both come out in the last week on you know, do you understand climate change? Here are the facts. Here's a quiz if you'd like to know more. And they're really going on the front foot, the academies, and uh, which I'm delighted to see. And uh, I've just been reappointed as chair of the ACT Climate Change Council, so you'll see me in a different light, having more conversations about this. And while I'm here, I should acknowledge Dorte Eklund from the Directorate of Environment and Planning and Emma Thomas from uh, Capital Metro. And there's probably some others here I acknowledge you too. Jeremy, last question. So, so the effect of, of improved communications is simply this. When I, having been through Canberra, been through Victoria, been through Queensland, and then I went to Tassie. And, and I understood the potential of that fire, its, it's magnitude, its scale, 
um, and the fact there were 20,000 tourists in its path who had little experience about bushfire, many of them from overseas and other parts of the world that didn't experience bushfire, nobody died. Not, not a single death in the Tasmanian bushfire. Lots of property lost, 200 odd houses and other properties lost, but no, death, no deaths. And, uh, and again, so we sort of unpackaged it and said, well, how did that happen? You know, one, good luck. Clearly there's an element of that. But the, but the chief officer, Mike Brown, his commander's intent was not put out the fire, send helicopters and all those sort of things. His number one commander's intent was uh, issue warnings. And they put all their effort into that. They understood that their capability was extremely constrained to be able to suppress or steer or do anything with the fire. So they still did that, but they put their efforts into communication and warnings. And they managed to get a lot of information out to people who made generally wise decisions, some lucky decisions, but generally wise decisions about how to get out of the way, basically. It was, it was so telling from you know, 2003 where it was no capacity to do that in any meaningful way. Victoria, not much better really in, in, uh, when you look at it. Queensland started to get better through um, the engagement of social media and all that comes with that, and floods are a bit of a different beast. And then into um, Tassie, where you, know, you could argue that that fire could have easily killed a couple hundred people. And it didn't. So I think, so I think, I think there has been a learning. And I've, and I've seen it in other disaster grounds since, that the, the, lo the, the loss of life rates are much lower than you could have otherwise perhaps expected 10 years ago. Property loss, not quite so. It's gone up a bit, but there's a reason for that. Um, the, the issue of trust, look, it's really hard to win. It's even harder to keep. But it starts by being real and telling the truth. The truth about limitation, the, the truth about the hazard space, the truth about its complexity, um, and it's also about uh, establishing and maintaining connection. And if you can't do that as a leader, if you can't show a vulnerability and make a connection, you'll never quite have people on board with you. Because that limitation of knowledge, skills, experience and imagination applies equally to me as it does to you. So the Mitchell Chemical Fire, for those who remember that uh, a couple of years ago, got that call about 11.30 at night, you know, oil on fire up at Mitchell. Seemed to be right at the time, by 5.30 in the morning, it was still going, getting worse. You know, temperature inversion came in, and then I got a briefing that said that uh, we've, we believe there's PCBs in the oil. Now, PCBs is a you know, certain chemical, if you like, and it produces potentially phosgene gas, which you can correlate to mustard gas. So, um, so here we have a fire, half a million litres of oil on fire, uh, contained but uncontrolled, burning fiercely putting up a toxic plume of smoke that's being suppressed by a temperature inversion, laying over the top of 80,000 people. What do you do with that? I've got no idea. And at 5.30 in the morning as a commissioner, I had no idea. But we worked it out. We actually went in and we worked it out and sat down with the industrial chemists and, you know, we got it almost right. The warnings we didn't quite get right and we paid a price for that. I think, I think we maintained trust because we built some credit points, but we lost a bit on the warnings issue. But we were very honest about limitation and capability. And we're very honest about failure. When we stuffed the warnings up, we called it and said, we, you know, we can do better and we have subsequently done better. But we all hit that limitation. And to show that vulnerability, so when you show it, you've got to say, but well, I'm going to go and find out and I'll come back to you. Here's, now here's the irony with that fire, just, just again, a personal reflection. Not six months before, the government ran an exercise, a counter-terrorism exercise that combined a bushfire uh, with a traffic accident, with a building collapse, and a smoke plume. And you'd say, well, how's all that going to happen at once? A pretty smart terrorist, I've got to tell you, but nonetheless, it was designed to test arrangements. And we solved the traffic accident, we solved the bushfire, we solved the building collapse. When it came to the smoke plume, and it was a smoke plume over 20,000 people, and it had radio, radiation and other toxic substances in the smoke plume, it, we kind of hit a wall in the exercise. And we said, well, God, how would you solve that? And we, we sort of looked at it for half an hour, and the exercise Controller said, Can we, look, why don't we just move past it and we'll look at the rest of the arrangement. So we moved past it. Nobody ever thought to go back and have a good look at it because everybody thought that thing won't happen because it was a terrorist event and that's highly unlikely to happen in Canberra. None of us had envisaged the Mitchell chemical fire. What we could have learnt out of that exercise from a theoretical terrorist attack, we could have absolutely applied to the Mitchell chemical fire. Now, now we got there in the end, but geez, we would have benefited from looking at that problem uh, more patiently and more thoroughly, uh, not, knowing, not even knowing Mitchell was going to happen, but it would have been better for the experience. So it's just a really, ca really simple case study example.
Trust is the performance measure, Jeremy. No one escapes that in public life. Chief Minister, Premier, Prime Minister, Director General, Commissioner, doesn't matter, uh, sector manager, you know, branch head, doesn't matter. You're leading, you're asking people to trust you. You've got to honour it. Good Thanks, Sean. All right. I think we'll give you a rest now. Thanks for that. Um, could you join me in thanking Mark, please?